And the other piece that you had? Uh, this is uh, Shem the Penman exposed and uh, finally confessing. And uh, the fascinating thing about the confession is it starts out in Shem's voice in which he confesses all of his sins in the tra traditional form of the Roman Catholic confessional. Uh, but gradually his voice fades into the voice of his mother, the river, who forgives everybody and everything and just flows on with total indifference to human standards of good and evil. Uh, and it's the passive yang force giving way to the active yin force and the isomorphism with uh, the I Ching. Dominus Vobiscus, my fault, his fault, a kingship through a fault. Pariah, cannibal Cain, I who oathly forswore the womb that bore you, and the paps I sometimes sucked. You who have ever since been one black mass of jigs and jim jams, haunted by a convulsionary sense of not having been or being all that I might have been or you meant to be coming, bewailing like a man that innocence which I could not defend like a woman. Hello, you there, Kathman Carberry, and thank movies from the innermost depths of my still atrite heart, where in the days of you youth are ever mixed my mind, now ere the complain hour of being alone at hands itself, and a puff or so before we yield our spirit as to the wind. For, though that royal one has not yet drunk a goulette from his consummation in the flower pot on the pole, the spaniel pack and their query, retainers and the public house proprietor have not budged a mil millimeter, and all that has been done or yet to be done and then done again, when days woe and lo your doom, joy day dawns and lie you dominate. It is to you, first born and first fruit of woe, to me, branded sheep, pick of the waste paper baskel, by the tremors of thundery and Ulleran's dog star, you alone, wind-blasted tree of the knowledge of beautiful and evil, a clothed upon with the meteor and shimmering like the Horacens, astro gob the mano logos, the child of Nilfit's father, blub to me, unseen blusher in an obscene coal hole, the cubal bum of your secret sigh, dweller in the down and outermost, where voice only of the dead may come, because ye left from me. Because ye laughed on me, because, O oh, me lonely son, ye are forgetting me, that our turf brown mummy is a coming, Alpilla, Beltilla, Siltilla, Deltilla, running with her tidings, all the news of the great big world. Sonny's had a scrap, whoa, whoa, whoa. Bab's baby walks at seven months, way, way, way. Bride leaves her raid at punches time, stud stoned before a race course full, two bells that make the one appeal, dry yanks will visit all side, and forty of skirts are up, madame, while Paracne wears popular short legs and twelve hows to mix a tipsy wake. Did ye hear, Colt Cooney? Did ye ever filly for Tescu? With a back, with a spring, all her real ringlet shaking, rock drops in her taki, tram tokens in her hair, all waved to a point, and then all innuendation. Little old-fashioned mummy, little wonderful mummy, ducking under bridges, bell-hopping the wares, dodging by a bit of bog, 
rapid shooting round the bends, by Talat's green hills and the pools of the Puka, and a place they call it Blessington, and slipping sly by Sally Noggin, as happy as the day is wet, babbling, bubbling, chattering to herself, deluthering the fields on their elbows, leaning with their sleuthering slide of her, giddy gaddy granny ma gossipacious and Olivia. He lifts the life wand and the dumb speak. Good, good example. Oh, I love that stuff. The alliteration uh, just sort of sweeps you into the flow of the... Yeah, you really get into the flowing of the river. Yeah, the river runs all through the book. Uh, it's on many levels, and on one level, uh, Joy seems to have used as the setting an inn in Chapel Lizard, uh, and that inn is right next to the River Liffey. So the, if the, the dreamer is an innkeeper, and he's, his house in the dream, is, his inn is right next to the river, so the river runs all through the dream very realistically. I mean, it's getting into his brain. As Joy said, you close your eyes when you sleep, but you don't close your ears. So all the sounds of the night get into the dream. The thunder strikes ten times, the rain falls twice, and the river runs all through it, and the church bells chime the hours, and one part of the brain is registering all those external realities, while another part is reliving the life of Confucius in China, and uh, another part is still back in Phoenix Park explaining he didn't take down his pants to expose himself to the girls. <laughs> Well, um, do you have any little examples that you'd like to read to us that uh, come to your mind? <laughs> I'd like to read two of my favorite passages. They're both from the chapter about Shem the Penman. Shem the uh, Penman is uh, a character from Victorian melodrama. Jim the Penman was an Irishman who went to Paris and became a forger. And Joyce went to Paris. Joyce was uh, as I read in uh, Gaelic. James Joyce would be Seamus uh, Sheehy, and so Joyce was a Seamus or a Shem uh, in Gaelic. And so he took this Victorian melodrama as a parallel to his own life. And he, and so in Finnegan's Wake, he treats his books as forgeries. Uh, and this passage, the theme of forgery and alchemy are intimately connected because Joyce also regarded himself as an alchemist, taking all the gross matter of the world and turning it into sublime, eternal art. And uh, he, he also he also compares his work to the, what the priest does in the mass. Only Joyce felt he was doing it for the real, for real. The priests were faking it, which is to turn the mortal into the immortal. And so this is an alchemist or a forger. It's either a magician or a criminal. And it's also a parody of Joyce and his obsessions. Um, the house of O'Shea, or O'Shame, known as the haunted ink bottle, no number, brimstone walk, Asia in Ireland. And as it was infested with the raps, with his pen name shut, sepia scraped to the door plate, and a blind of black sailcloth over its wand fish bogue, in which the sole contracted son of the secret cell groped through life at the expense of the taxpayers, dejected into day and night with Jesuit bark and bitter bite. Calcedo hydrants of sulfur for scalpalania by full and forty queasy nose, every day in everyone's way, more exceeding in violent abuse of self and others, was the worst it is hoped even in our western playboyish world, for pure mouse farm filth. You brag of your brass castle or your tiled house in Bally Fairmont. Nigs, nigs, and nigs again. For this was a stinksome ink and stink, quite puzzled to the rotal smatter of fact. 
Angels afternoon browning there through, not Edom reeked more rare. My wood! The warped flooring of his lair and the sound conducting walls thereof, to say nothing of the uprights and imposts, were Persianly literatured with burst love letters, tell-tale stories, sticky back snaps, doubtful eggshells, bouchers, flints, borers, puffers, amalgamated diamonds, rindless raisins, alfi betty formed verbiage, vivical viuses, comforter dictas, visas and bouquets, hems and ahas, ineffable tries at speech unassyllabled, you owe me's, I owe him's, flu foul smut, fallen lucifers, Vestas which had served, showered ornaments, borrowed brogues, reversible jackets, black eye lenses, family jars, false hair shirts, god forsaken scapulars, never worn breeches, cutthroat ties, counterfeit franks, best intentions, curried notes, upper Latin tintax, unused mill and stumping stones, twisted quills, painful digests, magnifying wine glasses, solid objects cast at goblins, once current puns, quashed quotatoes, messes of marriage, unquestionable issue papers, seedy ejaculations, limerick dams, crocodile tears, spilt ink, blasphematory spits, stale chestnuts, schoolgirls, young ladies, milkmaids, washerwomen, shopkeepers' wives, merry widows, ex-nuns, vice abbesses, pro-virgins, super whores, silent sisters, trolleys, aunts, grandmothers, mother-in-laws, foster mothers, godmothers, garters! Trees drippings from right, lift and centrum, worms of snot, toothsome pickling, cans of Swiss condensed milk, high-blown lotions, kisses from the antipodes, presents from pickpockets, borrowed plumes, relaxable hand grips, princess promises, lees of wine, deodorized carbons, convertible collars, the lucre daffers, broken wafers, unloosed shoe latchet, crooked straight waistcoats, fresh horrors from Hades, globules of mercury, undeleted gleet, glass eyes for an eye, gloss teeth for a tooth, war moans, special size, long sufferings of long standings, ahs, ohs, wheeze, sees, yas, yos, gaias, nays, thoughts, so's, yeses, and yeses, and yeses, to which, if one has the stomach to add the breakages, upheavals, distortions, inversions of all chambermaid music, one stands, given a grain of goodwill, a fair chance of actually seeing the whirling dervish, tumult, son of thunder, self as exiled, in upon his ego, a night long of shaking betwixt tween white or red horrors, noonday terrorized to skin and bone by an ineluctable phantom, may the shaper have mercy on him, writing the mystery of himself in furniture. Now, why did you select that specific one? Um, that's one of the more nightmarish passages, but it's also one of the more charming because the nightmare gets a bit absurd. It goes too far. It's a parody of a nightmare. The dreamer is having a quiet chuckle at that point, I think. Uh, the uh, And the symbolism of the clown and the, uh, the magician, the way, the way he runs the two of them together. Uh, the artist is both a clown and a magician. 